there is even more new evidence that diet may affect the onset and severity of MS. What we eat plays a significant role in symptom management and may also affect MS progression. I've said it before and I will say it again. We need to eat like we give a damn. In today's video, I'm going to share information on two new studies that were recently released. One from the Neuroepidemiology Unit at the University of Melbourne and the other from the Institute of Neuroanatomy at the University of Bonn in Germany. Hello, my dear friends, and welcome. I'm glad that you're here. It seems like every month there's yet another new study that comes across my desk showing how diet may play a role in the development of MS, the course of the disease, or the quality of our life. First, let's look at the study from the University of Melbourne. This is a continuation of the Holism study, the health outcomes and lifestyle in a sample of people with multiple sclerosis, which I've talked about before in other videos. It's an ongoing study of people with MS and their dietary habits. It's an observational study that tracks dietary habits over time. The most recently published study data is the longitudinal association between quality of diet and disability over seven and a half years in an international sample of people with multiple sclerosis. I am a big fan of this study because it's a longitudinal study and it's the first study in the world to look at people's diets prospectively instead of retrospectively. It's taking a group of people and following them over time, over a long period of time. Prospective studies are less prone to measurement errors than retrospective studies, and they're very well respected. They are considered by some to be second only to randomized control trials. One area where I feel they're better than randomized control trials is they provide long-term evaluation of outcomes on the effects of disease. Most phases of our drug trials only run for one to four years. The Holism study started in 2012, and they're presenting data in this report on the dietary habits after seven and a half years on 671 people with MS. 671. That's a huge sample size. They looked at multiple diets, including the Ashton Embry Best Bet diet, the McDougall diet, the Overcoming MS diet, the Paleolithic diet, the Swank diet, and the Walls diet. They used a dietary habits questionnaire and a patient-determined MS severity score, both of which were externally validated and are a highly respected way to look at the data. The study got a baseline of the dietary habits at the start and presented data at two and a half years, five years, and now at seven and a half years. The most recent findings that were reported in the Frontiers in Nutrition showed that 42% of people with MS reported ongoing adherence to an MS diet in both time points, the start and at seven and a half years. OMS 33%, Swank 4%, Walls 1.5%, and the others less than 1%. Of these, only the OMS diet adherence was analyzed for associations due to the data availability. Ongoing adherence to the OMS diet or a high-quality diet was associated with lower depression compared to non-adherence, and ongoing adherence to OMS diet was associated with lower fatigue and lower severe disability compared to those that ceased adherence to the diets. This is huge. Anyone want less depression, less fatigue, and less chance of severe dis disability? Anyone? Yes, this is patient determined and it's through questionnaires, but hear me out. This is a large sample size over a long period of time and this prospective way to collect the data and analyze it is highly respected. If you could reduce your depression, fatigue, and possibly future disability by eating healthy, would you do it? Especially if there was no potential negative side effects? Disclaimer, the, oh, thunder. Disclaimer. There are some potential other side effects of eating a better diet, though, that are not related to MS. Less heart disease, less diabetes, less cancer, and higher longevity. Before we continue, could you hit the like button and subscribe? This is important because it really helps to support the channel and it will help it to reach more people. Thanks. Okay, 
I see you doubters out there. I see you. Oh, I've tried all the diets and they don't work. Here's the thing. We need to keep up with the good diets for more than a few weeks or a few months. This is a years long or lifelong commitment. We need to consistently feed our bodies the most nutritious and healthy foods possible for long-term benefits. We can't expect results from eating healthy for a short period of time, just like we can't expect a weight loss diet to work after giving up one donut. Okay, let's look at the second study out of Germany. This study focused on milk proteins and how they may affect people with MS. There's been lots of previous research on how saturated fats like those found in dairy could be associated with the development and worsening of MS. There's also been research showing an association with a specific milk protein called buterophilin, which has similarities to the proteins in our myelin called MOG, myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein. If these proteins get into our systems through leaky gut, they may cause our body to accidentally attack our own protective myelin sheaths. Our immune system sees the buterophilin attacks it, remembers it, and then it may mistakenly attack our myelin that has a similar structure. But in this study released in July of 2023 in Frontiers of Immunology entitled The Prevalence of IgG Antibodies Against Milk and Milk Antigens in Patients with Multiple Sclerosis, they found that dairy proteins were likely to trigger an immune response in people with MS. Dairy may enhance inflammatory responses in people with MS. One of the things that I really liked about this study is that they used humans, and they studied humans. Many of the studies out there are using rats and mice, so they're somewhat limited in how the results can translate to humans. The researchers measured the blood antibodies of people with MS against healthy controls and found that those with MS had significantly higher levels of antibodies against cow milk followed by goat milk. When they looked a bit closer, they found that there were higher antibodies against beta casein, one of the most prevalent proteins in dairy. And they also found there was a greater reactivity to beta lactalbumin, another cow's milk protein. They shared that the immune response to cow milk proteins may result in a cross reactivity to proteins found in the brain and spinal cord. They concluded, we hypothesize that consumption of animal-based milk antigens that share sequence or structural similarities with human tissue-specific proteins can result in mimicry-induced misfires of the immune system in susceptible individuals. We may get attacked by our own immune system because the dairy proteins are considered a threat and they look like our own tissues. When you really stop and think about it, it is odd that we're the only species that drinks the milk of another animal and the only species that drinks milk past infancy. I know, I know, it's hard. But geez, but ice cream, but cream in my coffee. I hear you. I was totally addicted to dairy too. But once I gave it up, I lost my taste for it and it doesn't even tempt me anymore. When it comes to overall health and dairy consumption, there are also some concerns. Too much saturated fat in our diets can lead to cardiovascular diseases, and up to 68% of the world's population develops lactose malabsorption after infancy. We become lactose intolerant. Again, we're the only species that drinks milk of another species, and the only species that drinks it past infancy. So we could possibly reduce the risk for cardiovascular disease, lactose reactions, and reduce mimicry-induced misfires of the immune system. Perhaps it's time to ditch the dairy. So what can we take from these two recent studies in addition to the past studies? It's becoming more and more clear that our dietary choices may matter when it comes to the development of MS, managing our symptoms, and quite possibly a cruel of disability. We benefit from eating the most nutrient-dense foods possible to support our bodies and by avoiding foods that increase inflammation or trigger our immune systems to attack our own cells. As always, I will post links to the studies and the papers below. To see more on foods to support health, 
Watch these videos next. Please don't forget to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and subscribe to my newsletter where I share healthy recipes using the link below. Until next time, be well.